The following podcast contains advertisements. If you prefer a podcast without advertisements, you can sign up for our ad-free version at patreon.com slash lawfare. That's patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll get rid of the ads and we'll be very grateful. Did you know this podcast is powered by Acast? Acast is the home of podcasting. For creators looking for freedom to grow their listeners and make money too. And creative brands looking for smart ways to advertise. Podcasters and advertisers in the know know Acast. It's time you did too. Visit Acast.com to find out more. Acast. For the stories. We shouldn't make any mistake that any vaccine even in a world where everyone was endorsing it, would have faced some hesitancy. And the stream of negative information that's come in particular from prominent news outlets and political elites is likely to reach many more people at a higher volume than these particular Facebook disinformation sources. I'm Quinta Jurassic, and this is The Lawfare Podcast, July 22nd, 2021. This week, we're bringing you the breakdown of the heavyweight bout of the century, a battle over vaccine misinformation. In the left corner, we have the White House, known for its impressive arsenal and bully pulpit. This week, it asked for the fight and came out swinging with claims that Facebook is the killer, and not in a good way. In the right corner, we have Facebook, known for its ability to just keep taking punches while continuing to grace our screens and rake in the cash. The company has hit back with gusto, saying that Facebook has actually helped people learn the facts on vaccines, period. Will either of them land a knockout blow? Is this just the first round of many matchups? On this episode of our Arbiters of Truth series and our online information ecosystem, we devote the conversation to the latest slugfest between Facebook and the White House. Evelyn Duick and I spoke with Renee D'Aresta, the research manager at the Stanford Internet Observatory, and Brendan Nyan, professor of government at Dartmouth University, both of whom have been working on questions of online health misinformation. This is the expert rundown you won't find on Twitter. Let's get ready to rumble. It's the Lawfare Podcast, July 22nd. Facebook versus the White House. Renee D'Aresta and Brendan Nyan weigh in. Renee and Brendan, thank you so much for joining us to discuss this week's heavyweight bout, which is the White House versus Facebook. The good thing is that, of course, this isn't a nuanced topic that people have strong feelings about, so I'm sure we definitely won't upset anyone. Before we get into it, I did want to set out the background on how we got here. There are longstanding tensions between this administration and Facebook. Uh, Listeners might recall President Biden's angry comments about Facebook's handling of falsehoods about him during the 2020 presidential campaign. Uh, But this particular round began this July with the release of the Surgeon General's advisory on confronting health misinformation. Uh, Following that, the White House made some aggressive statements about Facebook's role in spreading bad information around COVID-19 vaccines. Biden said that Facebook is killing people. Facebook said, let's stop finger pointing. Biden said Facebook shouldn't take what he said personally. (laughs) We'll we'll dig into more of the specifics later. But to start off, Renee, how would you frame what the administration and Facebook are actually fighting about here? What's at stake? Well, what's at stake is we're in the midst of a pandemic and we're increasingly at a point where vaccination rates have plateaued. And so there's a lot of concern about how to pick those rates back up again. And one of the things that we understand about vaccine hesitancy is that it's not uniformly distributed, right? It is specific to particular communities. Particular communities have different reasons for experiencing hesitancy. And right now, today, many people get their information from social media. They engage, they communicate, they form strong ties with people on social media. And so the administration is trying to understand what are those people seeing, what are they hearing, and how can those hesitancy narratives be countered? Brandon, is there anything you'd like to add to that in terms of what listeners should understand on a baseline level before we get into the details? Well, I'm a political scientist, so I'll emphasize the politics. The Biden administration is under pressure politically to increase the vaccination rate, both because they fell a bit short of their target and just because they'd 
like to promote as high a vaccination rate as possible. And they're casting about looking for ways to do that and probably villains to identify. Uh, And Facebook is an organization that they have more leverage over than, say, Fox News or the Republican Party. This is a fight they can pick where the external pressure they bring to bear might, I would imagine they conjecture, influence Facebook's behavior on the margin. And so they're going to put the spotlight on them. And of course, are in our media environment, uh, we're all too happy to oblige in our ongoing uh, pattern of, of focusing on Facebook to the exclusion of the rest of the online information environment. So I think that's really useful framing of uh, villains. It's this kind of good versus evil, not at all reductionist framing. I think, you know, basically the way that the argument was playing out over the weekend was, is Facebook killing people or is Facebook saving lives? So sort of framing it in that binary, um, which one is it, Brendan? And you can only pick one. Well, I reject that binary and uh, I, I'm going to refuse to play that game. I don't think um, we should think about Facebook as having one effect. This is the largest communication uh, medium in the history of human civilization. It does not have one simple effect. And I don't think it's especially helpful to think in terms of whether it's killing people or not. I think there's a reason that even Biden himself walked that comment back. What we have to think about is what do we know about the effects of Facebook and how it could influence vaccine hesitancy? Uh, and that's it. Turns out to be a very complicated story, and one we don't know. We don't have very good answers to, given the data that are available to us. Um, in part because Facebook hasn't made as much data available as outside researchers like me would would like. So this is not a question that we have clear answers to. There are real reasons for concern, and folks like Renee have done incredible work on why we should be concerned. But I think what we have to avoid is the very simple story where Facebook is responsible for vaccine hesitancy, which I think is not at all supported by the evidentiary record, or simply the history of vaccine hesitancy, which long predates the existence of the internet, let alone Facebook. So I definitely want to come back to this question of Facebook's keeping or not keeping the data on these issues. But before we do that, Brendan, I'm going to piggyback on your reference to Renee's work. And Renee, I want to turn to you. You've been watching online mis- and disinformation about health and vaccines for a long time, well before COVID-19. Could you describe how you saw anti-vax communities form and develop online and maybe sketch out what the relationship is between these pre-existing anti-vax groups and COVID vaccine misinformation specifically? Sure. So as Brendan notes, um, vaccine misinformation long predated the internet. It dates back to the 1800s and smallpox variolation. We can talk about that at some point. But what we do see with the um, the way that it evolves online, the way that it manifests on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube in particular, is that there is now this very democratized ability where anyone can create and spread a message. And what we started to see in about 2009 was the anti-vaccine movement really beginning to prioritize that ability to tell their own story. And this was in part because at the time, particularly in 2009, most of the anti-vaccine movement was focused on misinformation about vaccines and autism. And so as the Wakefield paper, the sort of foundational paper claiming that vaccines cause autism, was retracted, media did begin over time to stop giving anti-vaccine opinions equal weight against doctors and those who are trying to encourage people to get their children their immunizations for school. And so in partially in response to that, when social media offered them the opportunity to grow their own movement and tell their own story, they availed themselves of it. And what was happening at the time was Facebook was similarly growing and Facebook was using tools like recommendation engines and algorithmic curation to push certain content into people's feeds proactively. And so when I was actually the way that I started looking at misinformation was that I was a mom, a new mom in late 2013. I had my first child and I started to see a lot of anti-vaccine content making its way into my feed through recommendations. I was not an anti-vaxxer. My child was vaccinated. I had absolutely no interest. In fact, I found anti-vaccine content, frankly, enraging most of the time. But because I was a, you know, I fit certain demographic criteria. I did certain things. I made my own baby food and I cloth diapered my baby, right? These are, these are signals that to the algorithm, it began to suggest to me that I might want to join these groups. And over time, these groups continued to grow. And what started to happen was what's known as collaborative filtering where a recommendation engine looks at your similarity to certain other types of people. And if you, if you share a certain amount of similarity, 
it recommends content that they like to you. And so you can choose whether or not to engage with it, or as I did, largely to ignore it for a time, but it's surfaced proactively for you. So this is where when people point to Facebook and say that Facebook helped the anti-vaccine movement grow, that was a dynamic that was very real and it happened for many years. Similarly on YouTube, if you engaged with anti-vaccine content, watched a video, the playlist would begin to recommend more to you. And that's because these groups and these channels were highly engaging. People came back. The groups had a lot of commenting, right? They were very, very activist groups. So to an algorithm that doesn't understand the substance of what it's showing you, these looked like great groups to be recommending to people and that continued to perpetuate the problem. Okay, great. I would like to just keep sort of scene setting for a minute. A lot of this conversation just plops in the phrase vaccine misinformation, like it's some sort of objective category in nature that we can easily identify um, and that everyone will agree with and that the only question is, are you pro-free speech or pro-censorship in some ways? But I, I guess my framing of the question is, is going to suggest that maybe this isn't such an easy line to draw. And I, I want to throw this to both of you, but maybe sort of just keep going with what you were talking about just then, Renee. Can you talk a little bit about sort of what this misinformation actually looks like um, so that we can get a little bit more specific and our listeners can get an idea of the kinds of claims that we're talking about and why line drawing might be difficult? Sure. So the question of what is misinformation is a, is a very, very big question. When we talk about it specifically in the context of the anti-vaccination movement, again, as, as we kind of alluded to, these narratives, anti-vaccine narratives, go back to the time of smallpox, to the very first vaccines. And there were concerns about safety There were concerns about efficacy. There were concerns about toxicity, right? So there were certain classes of misinformation. Um, You know, if you get the smallpox vaccine, you'll become part cow. You know, they didn't know about DNA then, but it was the sort of, you know, this idea that you would become a human animal hybrid if you if you accepted this immunization derived from from cows. And so this these claims are they're sort of inflected in modern ways today, but that class of claim they are falsifiable, right? There is scientific research that's been done to reinforce the safety of certain vaccines, the efficacy of certain vaccines, the you know studies into what ingredients may or may not be toxic and what concentrations, et cetera. There are, there are these classes of misinformation that are fact-checkable, if you will. Then there is what the anti-vaccine movement began to evolve into. So in 2015, there was a law to eliminate vaccine opt-outs in California. And this was long before even the debate about what Facebook's responsibility was. This was really just a debate about how could we increase immunization rates. And in in California in particular, that had just gone through the Disneyland measles outbreak. And so the question became, could we simply remove the personal belief exemption? And now full disclosure, I was a parent activist really working hard to get that law passed as a new mother whose son was too young for uh, an MMR vaccine when, uh, when Disneyland began to happen. And so there evolved a a new emphasis. The people who were trying to lobby for the right to not vaccinate their children began to appeal to personal liberty. And that is not a falsifiable claim. That is not misinformation. That's a political point of view. And saying, I don't want to take a vaccine is not a a falsifiable claim. Saying, you know, I don't think I should have to take a vaccine to work is again, a political opinion. And so even as Facebook began to, to think through what it was going to do about health misinformation as measles outbreak after measles outbreak started happening and legislators started wondering, you know, was social media partially responsible? They created this divide and they said, okay, we are going to downrank, we are going to throttle, we are going to label content that falls in the falsifiable camps and make it harder to find, but we are not going to touch the liberty argument because that is free expression, that is a political point of view. And so what you started to see in response was all of these groups that had previously been, you know, anti-vaccine for the toxins and autism and, you know, health reasons, pivoted their messaging and they all became medical freedom and health choice groups because they began to realize that this was sort of an area where we were not comfortable having a conversation, uh, you, you know, kind of tackling that question head on. And also it became very partisan and it became really easy to grow their movement by appealing to people who felt that desire for liberty in, you know, in a particular sense in another context and to say, see, you should be fighting on our side with us in this context as well. Brendan, you've 
written about the difference between health misinformation and political misinformation and how they might need different responses. And I think for all the reasons that Renee points out, this is a, a really important point to make because it's part of why Facebook refused to take down vaccine misinformation because it was so hard to draw the line. Was Facebook right or was it sort of overly cautious? Is it possible to draw a clear line here? Is there any way of distinguishing political debate from misinformation, given that, you know, on one side here, the politics are in fact based on misinformation? You're asking an academic if an issue is complicated, so I'll tell you the answer is yes. Um, But, you know, to elaborate on that point, I, I guess what I would say is I do think it's appropriate to try to draw a boundary between political misinformation, which I think should be, in general, we should be focusing on labeling and limiting spread rather than removal, and health misinformation that um, generates a direct threat to public health and safety. I think the principle of that notion is defensible. And I wrote a piece to that effect with Sarah Kreps early in the, the pandemic, basically arguing that the aggressive actions that Facebook was taking against COVID misinformation were both appropriate given the context and inappropriate to expect to be the new status quo for political misinformation because of those differences. As you both indicated, we've seen a gray area emerge where speech is both political misinformation and health misinformation in a complicated mix. I don't know that we want Facebook to be policing that kind of information. Those people who have called for that in an uncomplicated way should reflect, for instance, on how that kind of a policy might have been implemented when it comes to criticism of masking guidance early in the pandemic, which was later reversed. There are lots of reasons we should be circumspect about these kinds of approaches to aggressively policing speech. So that's an excellent lead-in to my my next question, which is that who who's in the right here in, in the fight between Facebook and the White House? We've just established that, you know, it really is hard to moderate content, and it is perhaps harder than the White House is acknowledging when it says that Facebook is killing people or that it's not doing enough. So does that mean that Facebook is in the right here, or is the White House right that they're falling down on the job? I'd be interested in hearing from both of you, but Renee, if you want to jump in. Yeah, well, I'm sort of in the uh, like, why not both camp here? And I don't think that throughout this pandemic, any any one entity has really kind of covered itself in glory. I think that we've seen the challenges of government projecting incomplete consensus as if it was established fact and then having to walk it back. I think we've seen social media platforms that, again, foundationally are in, in some very real ways responsible for the growth of the anti-vaccine movement and its networking with some of the anti-mask and other groups that it that it really kind of came to form alliances with, you can't discount the fact that that, that did happen and that the now is having a, a pretty profound impact. I think that as Brendan alluded to briefly at the start of our chat, media, right? So there's a lot of focus on anti-vaccine actors now and the sort of disinformation dozen, the sort of 12 actors that are, you know, particularly uh, high output content producers on uh, of anti-vaccine misinformation and and actually a whole range of health misinformation. They go way beyond vaccines with their sort of quackery. But at the same time, what we see now in the research that my group's been doing, uh, we have an inner institution entity called the Virality Project. And what we see is that even just purely based on engagement, right, recognizing that we, we don't have particularly complete data because of you know, Facebook's sort of structural limitations to research, but the posts that do go massively viral oftentimes are conservative influencers. And that's because, again, they're framing things in terms of this appeal to liberty. So it's not necessarily vaccine misinformation, but what they'll do, particularly Tucker Carlson, is they'll work a just asking questions angle into it. So it will be, I mean, maybe they're not telling us that the vaccines don't work. Why wouldn't they say that they work if they do work? You know, And so it skirts the line and uses a different rhetorical strategy. It doesn't come right out and cross the line by saying something that is sort of demonstrably falsifiable given the evidence that we do have. So there's like, there's no, <laughs> nobody is, is, is blameless here. 
Yeah, so Brendan, I do want to get to you, but, but before we do, I have one more question for Renee just on this, which is, Renee, I wanted to go back to your point that you made earlier about how sort of the the specifics of how Facebook was designed and how these groups grew on Facebook over the last few years has really gotten us to the point that we're at now. And I saw you, you wrote about this a little bit on Twitter and Kate Starbird at the University of Washington commented that because of this, she was arguing Facebook needs to think not only about how to stop making things worse, but also how to undo the damage that these past design choices have already caused. I'm, I'm curious what you think of that framing. I don't disagree with her. I think that she, so University of Washington is part of the Virality Project. So, so, so her researchers and, and Stanford Internet Observatory researchers are looking at a lot of the same things. But one thing I'll kind of draw a connection to is we also work together on the Election Integrity Partnership, which was looking at the misinformation narratives specifically related to voting that were coming out throughout the 2020 election. And again, there, one of the interesting dynamics was the role of QAnon, the QAnon communities, as profound amplifiers. So they might not have been the originators of all of the content, but they were very, very significant in amplifying things and in, in getting like large amounts of, um, of engagements and moving things through particular ecosystems. And we see this with anti-vaccine stuff too, uh, in the days of the pandemic video, sort of early on in the, in the pandemic in uh, April, I think 2020, that was content that originated in anti-vaccine echo chambers would move through this link sharing process where it would be shared into QAnon groups and then from there shared into kind of mainstream Trump supporter groups and then from there shared into like ordinary communities, right? Just people who have, they don't even sound vaguely political, but that was how that link was sort of traversing the, the networked ecosystem that, you know, Facebook brings people together. It forms these connections between people. People are complex and people are members of multiple communities. And so people act as conduits. So I think what Kate is getting at and, this is common to what we saw in the election misinformation. We see it in health misinformation. It's really how information moves. And that is one of the sort of foundational structural complexities underpinning a lot of this, which is just, it's very hard to, you know, you can, you can do content-based, pure content-based moderation, but that's a very whack-a-mole game as, as Evelyn has written about so elegantly. There's also this challenge of the network is here. The network is going to share something. The network is constantly going to be working to evade whatever content moderation frameworks or rules are put in place and to, to try to kind of route around those. And so what is the solution to that network structure? And as we saw with the election, interestingly, uh, after the election, Twitter chose to call a significant number of QAnon accounts. Facebook chose to dismantle a, a significant number of, of pages and, and groups. In an attempt, I think, to try to dismantle this infrastructure layer uh, without necessarily taking down the accounts, but disbanding the groups. Brendan, I, I want to put you on the spot as well. Who's in the right here? Is it Facebook or the White House? So I'm going to echo Renee in, in saying either, but I, I want to be specific about the both the faults in what Facebook has done and also um, what the Biden administration's framing is is not making clear. On the margin, exposure to misinformation, there's at least one study showing that exposure to misinformation can depress COVID vaccination intention. So when people are seeing this kind of misinformation on Facebook, it may be reducing their intention to vaccinate. And that may, that may in turn ultimately affect their behavior. We have no ability to measure that, but there's certainly reason for concern. And to the extent that Facebook has failed to take into account the way it's structure and algorithms have enabled the spread of anti-vaccine misinformation and the formation of groups and so forth in the way that Renee described that they're at fault for that and they should be held accountable. In particular, they should be more transparent in ways that enable outside researchers like myself or Renee to help raise the alarm when there is a problem so that action can be taken sooner. Facebook shouldn't be let off the hook for that problem. At the same time though, the idea that the problem is Facebook is, I think, a, a very simplistic rendering of just how people make decisions about healthcare and where they get information. Yes, Facebook is the largest social media platform. It's also the case, however, that information about COVID comes from everywhere. So if you think about all the information you've gotten about COVID vaccines in the last month, in the last week, in the last six months, right? How much of it came from Facebook, even for people who are mainlining Facebook, the fraction of that information that's coming from the particular kinds of dubious sources we're talking about 
is going to be, for almost everyone, low single digits. In my research prior to COVID, my co-authors and I found that uh, fewer than 20% of Americans will encounter a vaccine skeptical webpage in an entire year. And only 7.5% of the vaccine related pages people saw were actually to vaccine skeptical web pages. Now, and I, I just want to be really clear about this. It's both things can be true. It is possible that the anti vaccine movement has taken advantage of certain aspects of Facebook and that the effects of that on the margin are relatively small relative to the fraction of the American population that has chosen not to get vaccinated, right? One does not imply the other. Again, the, the administration is pointing to the easiest available target. And the, you know, the reasons that I talked about at the outset are, are quite obvious and important. The Biden White House attacking Fox News and the Republican Party and turning this into more of a partisan fight would be incredibly damaging to public health. The last thing we need is to further politicize vaccination. Facebook is the entity that they can challenge without fear of provoking that kind of a backlash. And so they have. But we shouldn't make any mistake that any vaccine, even in a world where everyone was endorsing it, would have faced some hesitancy. And the stream of negative information that's come in particular from prominent news outlets and political elites is likely to reach many more people at a higher volume than these particular Facebook disinformation sources, which you know, the engagement numbers look large until you start to think about the population of people on Facebook and how many views of particular types of content people ultimately end up having on the platform, which is, you know, hard for us to get our minds around. But I can, I, I'm, I'm confident that Fox News and the Republican Party reaches many more people than the 12 disinformation sources that have been identified on Facebook. Did you know this podcast is powered by Acast? Acast is the home of podcasting for creators looking for freedom to grow their listeners and make money too, and creative brands looking for smart ways to advertise. Podcasters and advertisers in the know know Acast. It's time you did too. Visit acast.com to find out more. Acast for the stories. Okay, so let's dig in a little more onto this question of data because it's played such an important role in this conversation. Both Facebook and the administration have been throwing around some big numbers like they will settle the matter. So Facebook, when it said, let's let's stop the finger pointing, pointed to um, you know the fact that 2 billion people had viewed authoritative vaccine information on the platform and that 3.3 million Americans had used Facebook's vaccine finder. It prompted the White House digital director to tweet, I guess I'm left with a simple question. How many people have seen COVID vaccine misinformation on Facebook? And so we get into this bizarre, you know, question of like, what what would prove what? And what people have viewed actually tells us very little. I mean, Renee, you were saying earlier that you've seen plenty of vaccine misinformation, but you are still not uh, vaccine skeptical. And this issue of data escalated again yesterday with reporting in the New York Times that Facebook wasn't giving the administration data on the reach of vaccine misinformation because Facebook um, wasn't tracking it. And, and in general, I'm really sympathetic to the idea that when it comes for demands for data from platforms, it's really often very easy in retrospect to say, oh, well, this number would have been really useful. Why didn't you track it? But uh, prospectively, it's difficult to work out exactly what platforms should track and they can't track everything. On the other hand, I think this was obviously going to be something that Facebook was asked about in the context of its handling of the pandemic. And it did track the good stuff um, with those numbers of views and things like that. And so I'm not super convinced that the idea that they um, couldn't or shouldn't have tracked the bad stuff is very compelling, especially given that the reporting pointed to the fact that they had had a meeting discussing whether they should should track it and, and decided not to. But Brendan, I'm curious what we should have asked for and what data would have been useful here and how whether this is something that's sort of susceptible to empirical investigation or falsification, any of these claims, and, and why it would be difficult for Facebook to just cough up the data. Well, I should say by way of full disclosure that I am part of the 2020 election project that's going on at Facebook right now. That's a partnership with outside researchers 
there is precedent for this kind of investigation, but it, it is not a trivial task. And of course, as we talked about, the outcome depends on how you measure misinformation. So once you reach an operational definition, sure, Facebook could try to estimate its reach and, and prevalence. And I do think they should try to do that. It's almost certainly the case that people in the public sphere and researchers won't necessarily agree with the definition that Facebook uses. And that's why transparency tools that allow outsiders to evaluate reach and spread are so important. So a very simple approach that could be used that I've proposed is to modify the existing CrowdTangle tool, which currently only tracks engagement on public pages to provide reach on posts by public pages, plus reach of URLs, which can be provided in a privacy protecting way, uh, similar to what, for instance, Google Trends allows. Aggregate data was enough coarsening that there's no re-identification risk. And then outside researchers could apply their own definitions. If they thought a particular post or a particular webpage was misinformation, they could assess its reach and spread on the platform themselves, even if Facebook didn't classify it as such. Uh, and indeed, they could help Facebook identify weaknesses in its systems that it might have missed. So I, I think there's an important path forward here where if Facebook's willing to, to take the criticism that's going to come with transparency, it could provide real benefits, both to our understanding of these questions and to Facebook's ultimate ability to defend against these threats. Renee, you also track this stuff, as, as we've been saying. So what would you like to see? What would be useful to you in your research? Yeah, well, so first of all, we use CrowdTangle. And I, and I, I want to just give, I think, Facebook and Twitter both some credit for actually providing researchers with tools to do such things. Tracking on YouTube is uh, you know, still, still a bit of a, a mystery. I think it's actually probably the area that we have least visibility. And so one of which also brings me to another point, which is while we talk a lot about Facebook, this is not limited to Facebook. The anti-vaccine strategy beginning in 2015 was to make sure that they had a highly visible presence on all platforms that they were using, all channels, and that wherever somebody was, they would be there and able to be found. And interestingly, long before Parler became a massively popular among conservatives, interestingly, anti-vaccine accounts had been some of the earliest adopters because they were sort of always on the, even when there was no real chance that they were going to get their accounts taken down, they would still always have this like, find me here if I lose my Facebook account kind of positioning on every single other social network. So recognizing that this is an ecosystem challenge and that one of the things that we try to do in our work at Virality Project and at SIO more generally is to be able to do these kind of traces across networks and across uh, across platforms. When we talk about looking at URLs, CrowdTangle does give us some of that kind of visibility into the number of, I think, non-public shares in its browser extension. So you can still see at least a little bit of a glimpse. You can't see who shared it or uh, or anything like that, but you can get a little bit more of a sense of, uh, of numbers. So you know, it, it's just, per Brendan's point, I think having more visibility into reach is useful, but also we always talk about the, you know, the denominator problem, right? Which is even back when we were talking about the internet research agency and we, and, and I did a lot of the work on that. And there too, I only had engagement data and I, you know, people would say like, did this change anybody's mind? And the answer is, I, I don't know, right? I can't see what they did next. I can't see if they were shown a recommendation. Did they follow, you know, did they follow it through? If they were served an ad that, that actually had a little bit of, I could see if they, you know, if, if how many people had clicked it, what the click through rate was, but this idea of, when information is presented to somebody, how do they go on to act? There's almost nothing that we have on that. We don't have visibility into the type of internal data that Facebook has. You may recall there was a, a leaked document that the Wall Street Journal got hold of where somebody internally assessed that 65% of the people who joined what they termed to be, I think, radical or kind of more extreme groups had done so through a suggestion from the recommendation engine. So that's a pretty profound number. And that's the sort of thing where, again, none of us on the outside have anything even close to that degree of understanding of the impact between prompt and response or, you know, whether or not someone had seen, whether it's Internet Research Agency memes and then gone and followed a page or anti-vaccine memes and then gone and decided not to take a vaccine. We just don't have 
the kind of visibility into subsequent actions or subsequent behaviors or subsequent communities joined that I think would tell us a little bit more about how people are actually responding to this content that that's really kind of like locked within Facebook. So this question of how do different people respond to the content I think is a really interesting one. It sort of gets at something that came up in the debate as well. So Facebook continuing with its very excellent comms handling of this entire thing in its blog post kind of made this point of it's not us, it's America, um, which it just seems like a great public relations point. So they sort of pointed to higher vaccination rates in other countries and concluded that this all suggests that there's more to, than Facebook to the outcome in the US. And that just seems like a totally wild thing for it to be saying. I I mean, I'm currently sitting in Australia where the vaccination rate is 11% and Facebook would be right in saying that that's not Facebook's fault. But on the other hand, that that stat doesn't actually tell us anything about the level of vaccine misinformation on Facebook in Australia. Like it's a it's a multifactorial thing. Do either of you have a view on whether this is a particularly American phenomenon? I mean, we've been talking so much about the politics here, um, which as an Australian does strike me as somewhat distinctive, but I'm curious as to whether either of you have any thoughts. I can tackle that maybe a little bit in that one of the things that we do at in our work at Virality Project, which is presently very focused on the U.S., we look at inputs in non-English languages. And it's very interesting to see which communities kind of take and translate American misinformation and then export it versus kind of come up with their own theories. You know, and, and so there's, there's, there's kind of like a spectrum there, but it is, it is the sort of thing that we're, that we're trying to get an understanding of. I will say with something like Plandemic, which was, we're, we're trying to do a little bit more of this very in-depth mapping of how something traversed, you know, straight through to other ecosystems as well. It's kind of a bit of a complex process. We're working on trying to make it faster. Um, but what we saw with Plandemic was the exporting of of an American propaganda product, American anti-vaccine propaganda product, to translations in other languages. So as the fact check was coming out in American media, it was being translated into, we saw it in Portuguese, we saw it in Greek, Serbian, Croatian, Italian, France, you know, French. It was just a whole litany of other countries kind of got the translated version of the, of the American product. So again, it's a kind of a borderless environment. And it is very interesting in that Oftentimes it is kind of U.S. content that makes its way outwards, but we do occasionally see kind of things coming in the other direction through translated media. Yeah, I'll, I'll add, if, if you'd like, that vaccine hesitancy is, is certainly not a U.S.-specific uh, phenomenon. We've seen problematic signs in European countries as well, for instance. And it does appear, uh, though, that there's a new paper in Nature Medicine finding much greater intent to vaccinate in low and middle income countries than in the US. And I do worry in particular about the way vaccination and COVID related public health policies in general are becoming mapped to the political divide in this country in a way that does seem relatively unique. For all the conflict over COVID around the world, the US is on a dangerous road towards a partisan divide over vaccines that we haven't had before. And that's a real threat to public health, given the intense partisanship we, of course, have in this country. The, relation, the correlation between the vote for President Trump in 2020 and the vaccination rate at the state and county level is matched in the individual level survey data. So there's real reason for concern that the U.S could have a uniquely polarized debate over COVID vaccinations. And that's precisely the opposite of what we want. We need a social consensus to help overcome the distrust that often hinders vaccines. And it, it's very hard to overcome that when a big segment of society and the people that are seen as trustworthy and sharing of people's values um, are indicating maybe they shouldn't get vaccinated. So I want to go back to something that Renee said earlier that warmed my heart 
regular listeners will not be surprised at this point, but I have a real sort of bee in my bonnet about why no one is talking about YouTube in this context. It is by some measures one of the biggest, potentially the biggest platform in the country. And it is certainly not the case that there is no vaccine misinformation on the platform. Uh, Renee, I know you've studied YouTube, but you've also looked at Amazon in detail, um, which is another platform that so rarely comes up in these conversations, but has its own problems as well. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you've seen on other platforms in in terms of this kind of problem and whether, you know, I, I guess as a very leading question, is this just a Facebook problem or, you know, is this something that is happening across other platforms that we should also be talking about? No, it's definitely not. It's definitely not a Facebook problem. Amazon is remarkable. It's it's just it's it's like the search engine for anything in the world that you might conceivably want to buy, and it's as instrumented as any other you know modern social platform. In that there are, you know, anytime you go and you look at a product, there are three different types of recommendation engines that are that are kind of serving you content. And that people who looked at this also looked at that. People who looked at this then went on to buy people who are interested in this content or also interested in this other content. You look at a book, it'll refer you to a product that goes along with it. There've been some, you know, somewhat comical is not quite the word. Remarkable might be the word. Uh, instances, I remember looking at one a couple of years back where uh, I was looking at cancer quackery on Amazon and the uh, information products that bolster cancer quackery, you know, juice fast books and things like this. And there was one for um, the Little Arsenic Cookbook, which was a book arguing that if you consumed arsenic, uh, it would cure your cancer. You know, <laughs> it would kill the cancer cells, might also, you know, kill you, but, you know, hey. And, and Amazon, you know, this was the surfaced in my looking at, at cancer books. And it surfaced um, apricot kernels, I think apricot seeds, because it's kind of like a naturally occurring source of arsenic. So you could buy the arsenic cookbook and then get your arsenic right there too. So I thought, you know, what a, what a remarkable, like, you know, if it, like mode of efficiency here and that, that hasn't changed. So that was, that was like you know, five years ago, maybe now, but, um, but that kind of dynamic is very much there. And if you engage with anti-vaccine content, similarly in the emails that Amazon will send you to try to drive you back, it will say, Hey, you looked at this product, but you didn't check it out. Here it is again. And here's a couple more things you might like. And because it is a search engine, it, it is a platform where when you are a book author or if you are categorizing a product, you have an extraordinary amount of discretion into how you categorize it. So the cancer quackery juice books show up in the oncology category because the people who have produced the books choose to put them there. Similarly, the kind of upcoming, you know, the pandemic guy is writing a book and he's classified it as some sort of science textbook. You know, so these are the sorts of things where in a thin category, that can kind of get you, you can get to number one status on sales within that category. Then you get kind of like a bestseller Amazon label. And this kind of provides additional signaling value that that maybe other people who are just there and browsing might actually like this book. Similarly, there's a lot of review brigading where products that, um, you know, that have a lot of five-star reviews are surfaced or, you know, ranked more heavily in the search engine. And this is entirely independent of vaccine misinformation. There is just sort of a constant ongoing war between Amazon's attempts to find these coordinated review manipulation efforts and the people who have things to sell working as hard as they can to find ways around uh, Amazon's automatic detection tools. So it's really sort of, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge, but it's definitely interesting, I think, in that Amazon, I've seen them take action only a handful of times and only when a government entity has reached out. They pulled down the anti-vaccine documentary Vaxxed, Andy Wakefield's documentary, after uh, in the midst of a measles outbreak, a representative Adam Schiff wrote a letter to, I think it was Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Amazon, in- inquiring as to you know, what kind of anti-vaccine misinformation was, uh, was on their platform. And then that documentary, which had been the subject of extensive review brigading, which led Amazon to inadvertently recommend it as the number one documentary when Prime Streaming Video was launched. Uh, That was when it finally got taken down. So there's a whole, there's a whole lot. Amazon is remarkable in in how nothing seems to like prompt a reckoning in any way. I also want to talk about the, the role of the broader information ecosystem. Brendan, we've kind of 
touched on uh, why the White House might be going after Facebook instead of, say, Fox. But I would be interested in hearing you talk more about what the research says about uh, how to think about the relationship between online misinformation and misinformation from more traditional news sources. I mean, Fox, for example, is obviously spreading a lot of misinformation. Tucker Carlson has repeatedly said the vaccine is dangerous and people shouldn't get it. How should we think about the role that that plays in all this? I think we should be quite worried. I've been struck by the parallels between what happened after the 2016 election and the way people blamed untrustworthy websites for the flood of misinformation in that election, which was largely attributable to Donald Trump, and the current context where people are focusing on sources on Facebook and other platforms that have relatively small reach compared to outlets like Fox and political elites who can generate national news coverage. In some ways, it's easy to blame the problem on these small, relatively unknown uh, sources. There's no one who will stick up for them in quite the same way. You're not going to offend half of your audience or even provoke a backlash. And it seems to square with people's intuition about the dangers of Facebook and resonate in a way that causes these stories to just run wild in, in, in people's mind. After 2016, people really thought that untrustworthy news was just flooding people's feeds and where people got their information and why Donald Trump won. And when folks like my co-authors and, and I or other scholars in the field looked at the data, we just found no evidence of that. Most of the misinformation people saw was from mainstream sources. And it's almost certainly the case that that's going to be true now as well. That doesn't make what's happening on Facebook not a concern. We very much need people like Renee watching that space and holding them accountable. But we have to grapple with the far more uncomfortable truth that it's the mainstream that is blocking the social consensus we need around COVID vaccination. There's no way around that fact. We're We're in a moment when state legislatures are passing bills against private institutions choosing to mandate vaccination, right? They're not saying we, the state in our public role, won't issue such a mandate. They're actually preventing private institutions from doing so. That is using the force of law to act against the goal of of encouraging people to get vaccinated, um, which of course, private institutions often do. My my children had to get vaccinated before they started kindergarten, just like they do everywhere. Um, And that's in a public setting, but that's of course true in private schools. That's going to be true here at Dartmouth where I work in the fall. That's a totally normal thing. So I worry that the desire to find a villain will cause us to lose sight of this far more difficult challenge, which is that we have to build a social consensus. And, you know, even if all of those sources on Facebook went away tomorrow, the challenge would still remain. I completely agree with that. I think the the challenge of consensus is really the overarching issue, whether it be election misinformation, health misinformation, it's, it's the environment of perpetual dissensus that's kind of come about through a series of, of different actor types behaving in particular ways, whether that's social media, media, government, prominent politicians. And that challenge, I think, is one of the things that I had in mind as I was reading the Surgeon General's advisory, which was one of the which is a really great document. It's not very long. I, I wish that the people would read it, you know, <laughs> maybe that's very naive. But but what I liked about the document was that it really pointed to all of these different stakeholder types, uh, to government, to media, to social media, and then also to ordinary people, right? And it said, we all have a role to play here. And we have to recognize that there are going to be moments in, in terms of the scientific facts of the matter where consensus is incomplete. We don't, we don't know yet. We don't really, you know, and, and we have to get comfortable with that not knowing. We have to get comfortable with, you know, government has to improve its messaging around times of that not knowing. As we've seen on several occasions, the mask issue, the lab leak issue, been a number of times when, you know, consensus has gone in a particular direction and then they've perhaps overstated it, which then creates opportunities for uh, incentivized actors to say, hey, look, they were wrong about this. Maybe they're wrong about the vaccine as well. You know, it's sort of the overstatement of, of certain certain types of knowledge that I think has been a real disaster from a communication standpoint. But the Surgeon General's document really gets at this this kind of call to action for all of the different facets of society to think about how they can kind of do their part, if you will, to 
to, to begin moving us towards an environment of, of being able to come to consensus again. I feel like it sounds a little Pollyanna-ish to say it, but I, you know, and, and I would, <laughs> I'd love to hear Brendan's thoughts on how one goes from a, a document calling for this to the actual execution of this and in, in a, you know, in creating that, that cohesion in a politically divided society. But I do think it's where we need to be going. So yeah, I just want to echo that the Surgeon General Advisory document is a really interesting document and it is super short. So it's definitely worth reading for people who are interested in this area. One of the things that I found really interesting about it is that it when it's talking about what social media companies can and should do, it actually stops short of asking them to take down misinformation and talks about a lot of the other measures that they could implement to be more successful around design questions rather than this false take down, leave up binary, as I, as I like to, to call it. You know, they talk about product changes, redesigning the recommendation algorithms, which we've talked about, um, building in frictions to stop people sharing it as quickly or it going quite as far and, and making it easier for people to report misinformation. But Brendan, you've done some of the most interesting work around what actually works in terms of correcting misbeliefs or misconceptions and also uh, somewhat well known for coining the phrase the backfire effect uh, or co-coining the phrase the backfire effect. Uh, this idea that when people see fact checks, they maybe just double down and believe something more strongly. So I'm wondering if you could sort of unpack that effect and whether or not like how strong it is, but then what actually works in terms of correcting misconceptions. The research since that paper was published, as you know, has found that backfire effects seem to be uh, extremely rare. In general, when people are exposed to corrective information, it does reduce the misperceptions they hold. So we shouldn't shy away from correcting misperceptions when it's appropriate. At the same time, I think we should be careful about assuming that correcting misperceptions is the most effective way to promote vaccination. That is much less clear. My co-author Jason Reifler and I have done a couple of papers where we found that even presenting corrective information about vaccines may not be effective at encouraging people to vaccinate. It's easy to play whack-a-mole with uh, the, mis- the misinformation that's out there. As Renee's comments have suggested, it's constantly shifting. I think a better approach is empowering people at the local level to determine how best to promote vaccination, right? So pushing resources and communication efforts downward local and state efforts to promote vaccination could be much more effective. So an example is the way that we saw in some states, not all states, but in the early days of the Affordable Care Act, there were state-related exchanges and Affordable Care Act-related provisions that were branded in ways that separated them from national politics. So people were able to say, this is a way to provide health care to our state that really tried to wall that off from the political controversy associated with Obama and, and, and national health care politics. I think we could do a lot if we moved in in that direction. There's no panacea here. We should also avoid assuming that a lack of vaccination is simply a matter of choice. It's easy to say, well, the vaccines have been available for a while now, and therefore everyone who hasn't gotten them has chosen not to do so. Issues of access are still extremely important given all the obstacles people face and all the other priorities that they have. We need to continue to provide opportunities to get vaccinated to people in all different kinds of contexts and not simply assume that this is a matter of winning some war of ideas. In some cases, it's going to be a matter of overcoming those logistical and access barriers that are hindering people getting vaccinated. And in particular, pairing those with appropriate restrictions on unmasked, you know, presence in contexts that are especially vulnerable to communicable disease. And in that context where if you might otherwise have to be masked and you have the option to instead get vaccinated, I think a lot of people uh, who are on the fence may actually ultimately choose to get vaccinated. And as we move through that process, I think ultimately we are going to end up in a place like our other vaccines where the issue is really relatively depoliticized. But the sooner we get there, the better, because every day of delay is more people getting sick and more people dying. And none of us want that. All right. I think we're going to have to end it there. Uh, Renee, Brendan, thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you. You've been listening to Arbiters of Truth, the Lawfare Podcast's mini-series on our online information ecosystem. 
You can find past episodes in the Lawfare Podcast feed, and we'll be back with another episode next Thursday. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. Our audio engineer was Hamza Shitu, and our producer is Jen Pacha Howell. Please rate and review the Lawfare Podcast on whatever app you use. And thanks for listening. ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. Hey, y'all, this is Kenya, creative director and co-founder of Domino Sound. And this is Alexandra De Palma, executive producer and co-founder of Domino Sound. And we're a queer, disabled, Black woman-owned podcast production company and network creating authentic, inclusive, provocative content. We just launched Domino Presents, which is a new series of special audio projects. The premiere episode features the founders of Poppy Juice, the queer art collective throwing the hottest parties in New York City and around the world. We also recommend The Cheat Code, our hit 10-episode audio soap opera surrounding a love affair. Think love and hip-hop meets The Affair meets The Sopranos. Follow us on IG at DominoSoundCO to keep up. And listen to our shows on the ACAST app or wherever you get your podcasts. Just search Domino Sound. ACAST. 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 ACAST.